Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm John, one of the co-owners, along with Kelly, who's uh, back there. Um, thank you uh, for all being here tonight after our one-day weather delay due to the snow yesterday. Um, we're very excited to have Grant Drumheller here with us tonight, and he's standing in this room full, full, of, uh, full of his work. Um, Grant is on our roster at Green Hut, and we were thrilled uh, when we had this space to be able to show bigger work that would be a real challenge for us to show at Green Hut. Um, so we're just really happy with how this uh, show turned out. Um, one thing that we love in particular about Grant's work is that it's always evolving. And whether that's uh, changing subject matters, palette, the type of paint used, or now even incorporating spray paint into some of his paintings, uh, the work just always feels fresh and exciting. Uh, Grant earned both his BFA and MFA from Boston University. He studied with Philip Gustin, James Weeks, and Reed Kay. Uh, he has taught at Boston University, where he taught uh, Green Hut artist Sarah Knox. Uh, the Art Institute of Boston, and this past year he retired as a professor of art at the University of New Hampshire, where he taught another great art artist, Kathy Smith. Uh, he's been the recipient of a Fulbright Hayes grant in painting. Uh, he's also been the recipient of a Blanche Coleman Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Artist Fellowship, a New England Foundation for the Arts grant, and a grant from the Pollock Krasner Foundation. And with that, Grant Drummiller. Uh, thank you for coming. I know it's cold and not the greatest time to go out, but uh, I appreciate your attendance. Um, so I uh, used to talk a lot about my work very frequently, and uh, I also go to a lot of talks by other artists, and I'm starting mine a little differently. I, 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 this is my mother. <laughs> And I, um, I pay tribute to her in so many ways in my work, but um, I think about her as instigating my life as an artist. Uh, uh, here's my dad. So I had uh, rather handsome parents and successful, and the, the script wasn't to be an artist. It was something else, perhaps. But my mother took me to the museum when I was three and four, and I can remember doing that pretty regularly, and uh, she would get a, uh, she would take me to museum classes at where I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. They had a great museum, art museum and children's classes, very similar to Boston. So um, I just, you know, here she is in India. And there's my dad in Tahiti. And that was long ago, and they are now dead. I uh, was in a bookstore about a year ago in Florida, and uh, they had this quote which I thought was remarkable and it spoke to me as an artist because uh, I feel that there's an arcane quality about contemporary art which uh, rather than inviting people in and uh, creating an audience is off-putting and just generally doesn't function as communication on any level. It's simply people speaking to themselves. And one of the inherent qualities of visual art is that it communicates and communicates in a very direct way. So that's something I think about. I think what kind of image will people understand? Will a child look at, not that that's a selected audience, but who will get this, this stuff I'm doing? You know, I, I really, um, and so I think about that. And I, um, since I, early on as a painter, I went to the McDowell Colony. I was with a bunch of writers and with a bunch of composers. And I had a different, uh, it was very interesting to sit down in a bar and drink and confirm some of your suspicions about those mediums and those art forms. But one thing I think that writing and literature has is that accessibility. So enough said about that. So um, early on, I started uh, painting. I went to art school at Boston University. I first started um, my studies at New York University for a year in liberal arts in um, 1971. 1971 in New York was the year to get mugged. I mean, it was not the year to be in New York City. And down in the village, you know, it was really great. It was a lot of fun to live there and to go out. And of course, 18 was a drinking age. And so I ended up in the middle of the year, like with the D average or D minus. And uh, I mean, I was quickly going to get thrown out. So, um, 
So I applied to art school and I got in. So I went to, uh, I heard, this is what you do when you're 18, you know, you hear two people say something's good and then you go devote your life to it. So <laughs> someone said, uh, I remember who it was, it was Bonnie Wexler, whose father published an Evergreen, the uh, hell-raising magazine in the 60s, if you recall the Evergreen magazine. And uh, she said, oh, BU's a great art school. And then somebody else said it, like, a, it, you know, it was just, so I went, I applied, I called my dad, this is where I give my father credit, I said, I've applied to art school, dad, and he said, yeah, I know, you got in, and I sent a deposit. <laughs> so that was like that, I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to Boston. <laughs> now I have to say, my parents were not living in the country at the time, they were living out abroad, and they were just kind of seeing, I was the last of four boys, so they were happy I was, you know, out of the nest and not, uh, I wasn't a big concern of theirs. It's not at all like it was today. Like, you know, everyone gets massaged to death. My kids were like launching into their 30s. It was like, if you couldn't, you couldn't swim by 18, forget it. <laughs> the message I got was, we'll pay for school, but once you're out, you got to do it. And then every dollar was like, <clears throat> you know, there was no more like the freebie, if I wanted a hundred bucks out of my dad, he was like, you better get a job, son. <laughs> One of those kind of harsh times, anyway. So, I, I went to BU, I had this incredible experience. I was really excited about learning everything I had to learn. I was, it was very comfortable to me to learn, try and learn how to draw. It was also a struggle. I didn't know how in the hell to draw at all. I thought I did, I knew how to copy, and I could do that pretty well, and, uh, I, but I did not know how to, pull something apart, analyze the form, make it move through space. I didn't know any of that stuff. I just certainly didn't know about organizing a composition. I mean, I learned that. I have to give credit to my teachers. They really, and they put up with me, so I'm very grateful. So anyway, uh, I went through for four years. I applied to a few graduate schools, but I really wanted to study with Philip Gustin, who was there, and I knew Jim Week's work, and he was a wonderful complement to that. And I launched myself into graduate school. And I talk about grad school because that's when you really are like stuck in a room alone and you have to come up with something. The rest of the time you're kind of learning a lot of nuts and bolts so you're just making mistakes. It doesn't matter much. So this painting of these wrestling, uh, this kind of wiffle ball of figures is about six and a half feet tall. It was sort of the moment in my final semester of grad school where I just let go and I was able to invent and move forms and, you know, create things piling up. And you know, it's obviously related to Gustin in a way, but it, was, it has a cartoon element and a freedom and a kind of jokey quality. I mean, I like the way the guy's fingers like balance on the water and the other guy's pushing down on it. I was, there's a little quotation of, of Picasso in it. And I liked the way the color worked, that kind of Tiepolo blue. I was, so I was, it was, I was trying to learn a kind of language that spoke to me and I was, and so I, uh, I the, the reason this came about was I was on a beach on Cape Cod, I looked over and I thought, what if everybody got up and had a fight? So that was the genesis of that painting. Part of my real, the thinking about the figure in space and the tradition of that is, it's a big ball of wax, and so I was not trying to replicate it, I was trying to bring it into the present in my way. I was paying heed to the modern masters, Leger, Picasso, as I said, artists like Beckman. So all these artists I was trying to absorb into my work. So um, I won't go stay here long. Uh, at grad before I graduated, I applied for a Fulbright grant to Italy, and I got it. So it was like a miracle. And um, I don't know what the Fulbright program is like anymore, but it was a year abroad. They paid you a stipend. It was usually enough to live, and you just were there. And you worked with somebody that made sure you didn't slit your wrists, and they, they, that was about it. They'd just check in once in a while, and you'd go to dinner with them. But it was really living, you know, kind of on your own. And so, Karina, my wife, and I got married, and we went to Florence. And so this is the result of that year in Florence. It's a lot of big, a very um, kind of muscular figure paintings. So I'll go through these rather quickly. So there it is. There's another one. Around this time in 1978, there were floods. Uh, there were uh, 
boat people, they, were, um, they called them, from Vietnam trying to get out. And the, the refugee issues have been going on for decades, as you well know. But that was the first wave, and there were, people were dying and you know, getting lost. And I was thinking of the Wrath of the Medusa and what can I do. And I just loved these triangles that were everywhere that I kept coming up with. Uh, and uh, this, this close space and this you know, improbability of that ladder in the middle of all of it. Um, well, upon all that, returning to the United States, I um, settled into a studio in Boston in 1979, and I started painting figures, and they, beca they became more and more solitary. I was getting some notice, and uh, around that time, I had a show in New York at Best Cutler Gallery on, down on, uh, on Mercer Street, and um, this is some of the work from that. But this painting here, uh, for no other reason is it, than that it was in a book, was a very important moment in that I was, I was sort of a published, I was in this book, and I remember not knowing anything about it. Someone had asked about um, my work, and it was in a, at a party. And, and then, um, I don't even know if I sent slides. I just simply heard about it from a colleague. He said, I was at Rizzoli and I saw this big book on postmodernism and there was a painting of yours reproduced in it. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And there, I was, so of course I got in my car and drove to Boston and I got the book. But I mean, it was, it was really nice, and, I found, and it was a full page, and I was like the bad example. If you read the text, it was like something ne negative was being stated. It was by, uh, and it ended up being by Charles Jenks, who was this noted scholar who recently died and, uh, on postmodern architecture and art. So, but, nevertheless, bad publicity is publicity. This is what you find out. Any news is news, good or bad. It's important just to be out there and uh, accept the consequences. So the tradition of the sculpture, as you might know, these are based on sculptural images, these last figures, is the uh, Zeus in the National Museum in Athens. And he's, the trident is really uh, what they, they used to think it was. It was maybe the uh, god of the sea, forget what his name is. But um, I put it as Zeus uh, holding a thunderbolt on a kind of smoky mountain with uh, you know, thunder around. That was my take on it. So <clears throat> I just I'm gonna tell you little stories around this painting. I'll keep going. The painting of Zeus ended up in a collection because of the book in Switzerland. And I, I mean, <laughs> the ups and downs of the art world are such that, and I've been close enough to success on so many occasions that I'm kind of blasé, but this was one brush and I was sort of like, oh, my life is gonna change. And it didn't, but um, I, uh, <laughs> The painting was bought by a hugely wealthy collector, American industrialist, a scion of a family who was living in many places but had a house in Athens and he thought this would be perfect next to his um, Cy Twombly and the other expensive things he owned. So it was purchased uh, by his, uh, a full-time curator he had flying around the world. A Swiss woman shows up in my apartment in Boston. We're living in New Hampshire. I'm teaching, I have two little kids, it was like, you know. She said, I just want to see if it is, looks as good as it does in reality. So she okayed it, the painting was picked up and sent to Zurich, it was framed and everything, and it was, it arrived. And then I get a call three months later, but we agreed to on a price, it was my wife uh, expressing that number, and it wasn't a lot, and um, she called about two months later the curator and she said, you know, you didn't charge a lot for that painting. Would you like to come to Greece and see it installed? And I was uncertain, but I did agree to that. And so we ended up going there and having a trip to Greece. We hadn't been abroad for years and years. So it was sort of incredible. And I got to meet the collector who didn't want anything to do with me further. But I mean, it was just uh, a, a kind of uh, one of those things that happens. And I remember saying to her, the curator, about a year later, you think I might get another sale out of this guy? And she said, if you get another book, I <laughs> was like, <laughs> it was that kind of deal. Anyway, so I was doing these gigantic paintings, as you can see, and uh, living and working in New Hampshire in a complete vacuum. I mean, it was really like, I, I mean, I was just, there was nobody doing this kind of work there, and I don't know how much sympathy, obviously there was some, but, um, 
So um, uh, the years went by and uh, I would get support and I'd get grants and so forth, but I wasn't showing that much uh, elsewhere. I was showing in Boston on occasion and um, I'm sort of fast forwarding. I don't have the ability to see what's in front of me, so I'm just going to go forward. Okay, so let's just go forward. So this is around the time of the birth of, of our child, first child. Yeah, it's a little hot, that image, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to stop right there. So right around there, um, I showed the work in Boston and, and in Cambridge at Betsy Van Buren. And, uh, and then I was hired at UNH permanently as a assistant professor. And again, my life as an artist uh, and uh, my parent, with parents and not having um, money, I, and so much of life is economic, I hate to bring that up, but it is, and um, I had to teach. And I was perfectly happy teaching, I was good at it. Because here's the thing, I was incredibly well trained. And I, I, I honestly was. I was pushed into it and I was made to do it. It was like whipping eggs every day by hand. I, was, I, have, I have that muscle memory. I can draw like a demon. I know I can and it's sort of, it's second nature. And it's only because I was extremely young and I was pushed to do it nine hours a week for four years straight. Every day, drew. That's a drawing class. Then I did a perspective class. That's another three hours a week. Then I painted, that's another three, six hours a week. So I was doing observational work on a 24 hour a week schedule at, for four years. I couldn't be bad. You'd have to be an absolute blothering idiot to be bad. I mean, it's sort of like dancing. If you can hold the position, you can do the stupid dance. You learn it. Um, maybe you have no artistry, but you learn this thing. So these are all from my head. And I look at them now and my perception is, is they're kind of soft, they're, they don't feel real. There's a generalization which I don't necessarily love, but uh, it's like I'm looking at somebody different. At any rate, there I am, the, there's a, it's not me of course, um, and I'm holding the sigh and it's spreading across and there's the woman underneath and the genitals. I remember the dealer in New York showing them, I, she was saying, well, I want to have a card and some detail that's polarized. This was a new technique. And she said, I said, well, what part are you going to take of which painting? And she went right up to this one and, and zeroed in on his crotch. <laughs> New York. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> you're either this or you're this. <laughs> If one figure is good, a hundred are better. <laughs> so I got more colorful. I started working with this kind of prismatic color and I started uh, working with these fat boys. I just thought, oh God, they're so, you know, rotund little men, rotund little white men. And I wanted this kind of, uh, I, I, I don't know what I had. I had not articulated it, but it was something. I wanted that intense color and I wanted the uh, drawing to come into it, the, in, the way of inventing. And just to, you know, where a brush stroke would start, I would do two lines and it would suddenly suggest a figurative gesture to me. And then that would develop into a figure. And then this color. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's kind of, I would, I, hmm. So these are a few, I'm just going to show you, get through this so we can get to this. So we're now like around 1988, yeah, 89. The Fall of the Damned. I love Rubens. I was experimenting with that indirect painting where it's uh, the kind of charcoal based on, on lead white and just working, you know, reading about how you make the flesh look like that. And I was using those crayons, those oil crayons that are so rich. They just leave this track of thick paint behind. This is huge. It's about 100 inches by 80, I would say. So you get an idea of some of these paintings. This is at a show in, um, at uh, Gordon College about uh, five years ago. I had a little mini retrospective there. 
And the way that Bruce, the director of the gallery, sort of set it up, it involves some of these paintings. These two are like twins, these horse paintings. On the left, I thought, well, fat boys, fat horses. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, whatever. So uh, <clears throat> the break came, really, for me, and going back, I was working from my imagination, and these images came about through a kind of process orientation. The real break came when my mother died, and I sort of thought the relationship of my work to my own feelings were, wasn't there. So I needed to have that um, reinstated. And what do you do? You go back to looking at yourself, or you look at something else. You re uh, reacquaint yourself with uh, looking and seeing and bring that to your work. So I shut myself in my studio and I started doing uh, self-portraits. I worked life-size. I really wanted it to be just about life-size. So this is me 20 years ago. Don't hold it against me. I had dark hair. Oh, these, I did some larger ones too. This is about uh, seven and a half feet. So, uh, so this is my uh, Ode to Zerberon, that great painting in the museum, and uh, it's in Hartford. It's, I think it's called, maybe it's not the one in Hartford, but at any rate, one of his saints is the eyes are rolling up in his head, looking up, you know, towards, you know, I guess God. And um, you can see I'm looking up at a little torpedo bomber where my, with my dad's plane in World War II was, he was a torpedo, he was a Navy pilot. So I, I wanted to put that in there flying over my head. And my mother was a collector of beautiful feminine things. She had stacks of gloves and, you know, that generation had nice things. And so I had all her gloves. It ended up coming to me all the gloves and the seven pairs of opera glasses, which didn't get used much, <laughs> except in my studio, I wore them out. Uh, so how would I do this painting? So I'd, put, I'd stretch these satin gloves over my hand, and I would put that down, and I would paint, and then I'd put it up and see if I could see my eyes through it. Right. So it was fun. It was like, you know, I'd get, I'd get my, take my shirt off, I'd go in, and I'd park myself in front of the mirror, and I'd, I'd use some of these accoutrements as um, things like this. So there's the bindi and the uh, sari. So 18 by 20 oil on panel. I was working on uh, a hard panel with um, bir Baltic birch. And I showed these at a little retrospective that went out to, from BU, and then it went out to Amherst College, to their museum there. This is a big one. Uh, it's really red, but it's not that red. I'm going to say that. And then a Grisaille portrait. It's probably one of my favorite ones. Big, eight feet. So um, let me sneak ahead and see what's coming. So from the self-portraits, I decided that, I mean, I couldn't do self-portraits all the time. I have a friend who's a self-portrait artist and she's struggling. I know we don't talk about it, but Suzanne, um, uh, oh, Jesus, what's her last name? At any rate, I know there's a, Tremendous number of artists out there that have made Susanna Coffey. She's made these incredible leaps in her self-portraiture, but she's stuck doing herself for the rest of her life. She's going to, one way or another, they're going to say, yeah, that's fine, paint a flower too, but eh, go back and paint yourself. You know, like, I just didn't want that typecasting. So um, the ultimate freedom, the ultimate thing about being an artist is that you have to be free. You have to do what you want, and at whatever cost you want. I mean, I got that lesson from Philip Guston. I mean, here was somebody who, when he would come in at the, uh, during graduate school, he would be drunk from lunch and he would be critting brilliantly, but he would also be muttering about a painting that sold at that time for $60,000 that someone had, he had given them. They had given the painting away. <laughs> it was up for auction and that day it had sold. I mean, that's something to bitch and moan about. I feel like, um, you know, but it was because he stopped doing these paintings of the uh, beautiful patches of color. He had changed that. And he thought that they were his weakest work. So, I mean, it was a different thing uh, for him to then establish a beachhead and turn his back on 
collectors. For me, I had nothing at stake. I, I, mean, I had no audience. There was no big price going on. There, I wasn't uh, inclined to do um, paintings that I had done before over and over again, which is very common and it's hard. You can understand if you're getting paid to do, why not do more? So I changed my um, thinking and I just thought, you know, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, here am I in my studio, I'm just going to reach out a little. I'm going to reach out a foot away, turn my head and look at an, a still life. So I, I, from 2002 onward, I started working again, continuing from life, working on still lifes. I don't know why that's there, but I'm going to go to the still lifes. So I had a series of paintings I did of a jacket that I remember from my childhood that my mom had, and I, again, I got it. My dad called me a month after she died, and he, she, he said, I got all this stuff. What am I going to do with it? Send it to me, Dad. So I got these things, and I recall this uh, silk jacket that she didn't wear often, but I just remember a glamorous golden aqua thing that was in my childhood memory. So I set it up in my studio, and I started painting it. Again, life size. This is a giant one, bad slide, with one of those mercury balls in the bottom. There's my self portrait in there. And that one, which I like a lot, with that paper as sort of a votive flame around it. I like, I like that one. It's up in the upper corner here. This is the Twin Towers and the Shadow Light. At 2001, so now I know what date we are, and this is my sink in my studio with the appropriate images at that time that I was loving, the Gustin and the Jim Weeks, and then there's the Piero and the St. Francis in the uh, Wilderness by Bellini at the Frick up there, and the, you know, the, so, the accoutrements of the studio and still lives. So I was working on still lives and trying to bring that into my work. Dried leaves, perfect, huh? So I'll just go through these. So, uh, what, uh, so around 2002, I'm looking at this and thinking, God, you're pretty good. You know, you didn't like lose anything here. It's sort of nice that I'm still able to pull this out of myself. I, I mean, I'm surprised, I was surprised. So I had to attend to that a little bit. And uh, it, I just like that visual feel that was open and empty and I could I could come in at it from the left, the right, above. It wasn't just that plastered thing on the tabletop, which is so much of a still life. It was other things. Uh, again, uh, I was um, interested in all sorts of things, and I discovered these little animals, and so they became part of the still lives. And you'll see they begin to take over and become just what the still lives are. So I'm sort of building up. You can see these little objects are kind of coming in here, and they relationship to the paintings in the room are not so uh, un unbelievable that small incidences in, the, in, in this related space and looking down kind of has a kind of resonance. Um, from, a from a still life to a room. Interiors. So um, this bed is in the uh, Surf Point Foundation collection and they haven't gotten rid of it, which I'm very happy to say. It's a uh, new foundation down in York, and um, Mary Lee Beverly Hallam bought this painting and used to sit in Beverly's uh, above her bed. And uh, it was just, uh, and my mother made that quilt. There's all sorts of significance to it, it's where uh, I live. And um, so um, the work got very personal about the self-portrait, and then it became personal about chosen still lives, and then more, you know, more diaristic about my own spaces and the places I inhabit. And that's sort of what's happened in these past 20 years in different ways. And I, you know, I'm a genre painter. I do portraits, I do still lives, I do, I do um, landscape paintings. I don't really like put a little tether on myself and say you can't do that. So I do a lot of different things. This is a big painting, it's about six by five feet. And uh, yeah, this is a small painting of a bed, my daughter's bed. So the little animals in Rome, I was uh, in residence at the American Academy in Rome. I had been a runner up for a grant there in the early 80s and I didn't get it. I called the grant, the uh, Rome Prize winner, Dennis Congdon, who teaches at RISD <laughs> at the time, and I said, you gonna go? <laughs> he said, 
paused and he said, yeah, absolutely. And I was like, so uh, I was a uh, kind of thing I just never got to do. And it was, uh, it's, it was, it is, it's a fabulous place. And in um, 2007, I uh, applied to go there as a resident artist, a uh, visiting artist. And they have a rental program. And, but, you, you know, there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, there's some kind of uh, vetting that they do. Because when I spoke to the guy, I said, don't you let everybody? And he was like, no. <laughs> I was like, so, okay. But you still have to pay. But anyway, it's this incredible place. Now, I'll just backtrack a little bit. In terms of Italy, we spent a lot of time there. We lived there for a year back in 1978. And it's a place we go back to. We brought our kids there on two occasions when they were very young. And we had friends there for a long time through the Fulbright in Florence and Rome. <clears throat> of course, is a fabulous city, and this is placed on one of those seven hills up above it. And so, I would go out on the terrace. I really wasn't able to accomplish a lot there. That's the trouble with residencies. You're sort of like upending your life and your working method, and you're to go to this place, and it's fine. But um, and the um, academy is an interesting thing. It's a mixed bag. It's um, filled with very talented people who think they're never going to have to work. I mean, they basically feel like they've landed on top of the world and they're going to sit on that Sunday until doomsday. But of course, they all go home in a year and they all have to be nice to other people. <laughs> but meanwhile, um, you know, people come and go like me and uh, other, other people in the academic world and other places. And um, it's fun, but uh, w uh, we're going to Rome in February for a month to just hang out and to walk around because I really am inspired by it. As you can see, it's in some of the work. And uh, we're not going to the academy. So it's just a different kettle of fish. I mean, I would say that you get great food there, and, uh, but you're cut off. It's high security, and it's not downtown Rome. So uh, it's in a big palace, and it's very grand. And sometimes you feel very good about yourself when you're there, and sometimes you just think, what am I doing here? Um, the studios are incredible, and if you have a real closed and tight project, I recommend it. Otherwise, I don't know what I, whether I would or not. But uh, in, I enjoyed it tremendously, and uh, this painting is just a confabulation of all these elements. I painted this, the landscape actually back here. Again, the color's a little bit off, but um, I laid out these animals on this table, and I just painted them, and then I, you know, I, put them in this space. So the, the, these little animals that you call these Schleich animals that you can find at airport stores and you can find them at cheese shops and you can find them in everywhere, toy stores. I just have bags of them. And to me, they were, I guess I was thinking I was painting an ark. I was referring back to ancient Rome when there was a lot of animals in, uh, going through that city. They, they come, uh, the whole world was coming through Rome. And uh, I, I thought I was painting the kind of downfall of nature. I just thought it was kind of an interesting idea. So I painted more of these animals. And again, it was a kind of still life thing. And I've got them on my floor in the studio looking down at them. The quilt was my mother's from her family. So that's why I'm painting that. And I uh, did a series of images from that. If you have any questions, please tell them, you know. Just ask me. Don't don't feel shy. We're a small enough group. Um, again, I collect fabrics. I had all these woven fabrics that I bought over the years, and I just started, you know, using them. This is called to the watering hole. I was thinking about animals kind of crossing barriers to come into this area to get water, and little creatures like the alligator down there, and lions and stuff, tigers and bears. So you get an idea of the scale of these things in this room. There's that painting back there on the far right wall, and there's the Rome painting. And this other painting here, I don't know if I have a slide of it, it I called it Plato's Cave, which is uh, relative to the Plato story. So let me go back. So among all this work, I sometimes do a portrait or two. And it's not that I don't do it that often, but I do um, enjoy them. So this is my son-in-law, Bruno, who's a brown person, I'm very proud to say. And he's a um, fabulous guy, just really a peace-loving, beautiful man, and uh, has made my daughter a much nicer person, I will just say that. <laughs> she's 
tell you, hooray Bruno. And uh, he, uh, that, I love this painting uh, just because of the way it happened. I, mean, I was struggling to make the, the he stood under a, a out, you know, an outdoor umbrella, and, you know, a table with an umbrella, and he went under there and there was this great light on him. And I just couldn't, I kept trying to paint the flesh the right color to have a kind of energy you felt some kind of, well, I remember my friend Jillian Peterson Craig saying, put a, a tone, put, put a wash over the entire painting and then paint back into it. And I did that, I put blue over the entire portrait and then I, in the background, and then I could paint back into it. And it, magic, it was the right color. So pro, I, I mean, process does have something to do with this. And I'm interested if you can see in the confirmation of light as a kind of way to, to both direct the eye but also compose the picture. So I'm thinking about color, medium value color, light as color but also as design and dark as design to where those shapes fall. And texture, even though there's a lot of it in my work, is not something I think a hell of a lot about. This is the uh, two people uh, in York Harbor uh, on who are now the, uh, this is where they have a new residence pro residency program in Southern Maine called the Surf Point Foundation. It's in this house and the lady on the right with the stern uh, poised uh, position is Mary Lee Smart and the lady in the distance is Beverly Hallam who's a painter. And they were a partnership, I don't know what kind, but they were a partnership that lasted many years and Mary Lee had all the dough and she um, built this fabulous property overlooking the ocean on 40 acres and her determination with her partner was to create a foundation and a residency program for artists and that's happened. You can go there, you can apply and you can go there. Well, I think you're recommended. That's right, you're recommended and you can go. So I knew these gals, you know, this was 2007, 8, they were like 80, 90, 2 maybe there. I'm thinking this is, a, this is really a temporary situation that needs to be documented. So I called them one February morning and I said, are you guys in mind, do you mind if I come over and take some photographs and I'd spend some time doing a little drawing and sketching? Pause, eh, yeah, you can come. So I go over there and Beverly's there and she looks at me as I'm doing this and she said, you must really need money. <laughs> Just like, and in fact, I didn't. You know, it was sort of like, well, there was no point to it. I didn't care. I never thought she'd buy it. So um, the, anyway, the house was one of these mid-century modern, perfect places, all like that, you know, the Saarinen womb chair, all the, everything. There's a Le Corbusier recliner opposite that. You know, there's all this great stuff and this fabulous view. And I wanted to paint these two guys because I thought they were just too, too cool. And, uh, you know, you turn a corner, there would be uh, Walt Kuhn on the wall and, you know, a letter from Richard Rogers to her husband who was a radio star. That's how she was so wealthy. But um, I did that painting, which is this big. And then I did another one. Where is it? There it is. Which is kind of the official portrait. And now it's in the Surfport Foundation. I mean, they have it there. So I'm very happy about that. And they had this fabulous um, room that was, they used to have a pool in there and they covered it over. Must have been some great parties there. So that, I, my portraiture, my ideal portraiture is to do people in their spaces. And so this is us in England. I was uh, commissioned to paint a portrait uh, of a man and I was, asked to go there. I was teaching in Italy and I, I remember the call and I said to the person, well I'm going to come and I'm going to look crummy because I've been teaching in Italy in the country for a month, but my wife will look good for us. So that's, <laughs> that's like it. So she thought that was okay. So anyway, we got met at the train, a plane in London with a chauffeur and someone carried our bags. I only tell you this because that's not my life. I don't live like, I mean, like I go to the grocery store like everybody else and I, you know, we have a little house and uh, it's just as an artist, sometimes you brush up against people that live a different life. And uh, now that I'm this age and I'm not teaching anymore and I don't need the money, 
I, my bottom line is, if it's interesting, I'll do it. If it's interesting, and uh, the people aren't crazy. Because rich people can be really crazy. <laughs> she said to me, um, well, it's kind of medieval here. We have lunch and breakfast. It's all served and everything. And I'm like, it's all right. I have 100 pounds in my pocket to get a cab if you're nutty. So I warned her. And she found that amusing. Because here's the other thing, no one speaks the truth to rich people. They just get told what they are to want to be told. Because that's the deal, you know? You get something if you get the right words back. So I was going to be very honest. And she, you know, as it turns out, she was a friend. So let me go backwards a little bit. Oh, there's another one of the girls. I'm, I'm sorry to do this. It's totally out of order. I'm going to go back this way. Okay, nope, oh, they're not there. So, going forward. So there's my neighbors. So I, we're in this place in the south of England, in Devon, and um, I'm gonna come up to this damn portrait. There they are. So they wanted a formal portrait. There's the house, and uh, Salcombe Peninsula. So nobody lives in the water in England, because you can't get there. So that's like around here, hey, there's a lot of shore frontage. <laughs> 400 acres, like it's a farm, there's cattle and stuff. Mr. Bean bought that house. <laughs> you know him, Roland, whatever his name is. But here's the lady of the house, and um, she, um, uh, you know, it was come and do a painting in a week, and then uh, if you can't finish it, we'll figure that out. So I painted every day for eight hours a day. I set up a studio in that upstairs in this beautiful contemporary house actually it was built in the 20s and I painted uh, her portrait and then uh, I didn't finish it quite and she called me I said I've got to go home and I did and I was gonna leave my paints there and I think I actually did I said I'll come back next summer I'll finish this or I'll come back sometime and I didn't get any money. That was the other thing. I did not want an advance. I didn't want to worry about it because you know that's part of, what, of doing a commission is you're a commercial artist and you have to have certain kind of strictures. I didn't have any. I was I was like, yeah, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So I, the painting was going along beautifully. The husband was coming up, very elderly, was coming up and checking in on me at this. He was down here drinking, but he would waddle up and up. So at the end of that week, I'm leaving and I say to Robert, well. Uh, I'll be back. He said, well, I hope so. The painting's coming along so brilliantly. And I was like, oh, you were looking. You know, I didn't even know. So here's the painting of the lady. I had the Princess Azermat doing the flowers because they have these hangers on that come in from London to the country. This is her little corgi dog. And she wore these awful glasses and I made her take them off and put them on her lap. And she was overweight, so I didn't want to make her look fat. So it had all these things. It had this, the, the you know, stuff. And I got her, and that painting I think is hanging in the Bath American Museum, which was a relative of his. And there he is, Robert. I, so I get a call. She said, you have to come back in August and finish the painting. We'll, we'll pay to have you come back. So I got on a plane. I said, I can come back if my wife can come, because I don't go anywhere without my wife. I just don't. I don't want to be alone. Um, fine. You pay for the, the wife, I'll, you know. So I said, fine, I don't care. Take it out of my commission. So I painted, she said, and bring another canvas to paint Robert. So I painted him in three or four days. So I didn't do that with his green Gucci velvet. Um, sh you know. He's since passed away and she's moved away from England. But anyway, that, that is what you do when you're an itinerant artist and you're looking for money <laughs> and, and you're looking for experiences that are fun. Because that was real. I was like, oh, it's really nice to be asked to fly to England to paint a portrait. I got to do this. But here's the thing, now that I'm 10 years long, I'm thinking, if I ever do that again, I'll, I'm going to have to take drugs because I was so worried that it wouldn't work out. I'd be stuck in this house, the painting would suck, and I would have to get, you know, slither out the back door and get on. <laughs> I just, I mean, the, I was thinking of the disaster that could have struck. It all worked out fine, but that was that. So, uh, present forward, some of these paintings are of these omniscient views that developed uh, in that time when I was at the Academy, we came down and stayed in the center of Rome. I set up my video camera, I put it on a tripod, and I uh, would push it on when I'd get up to pee at night at two in the morning to just take a picture of the 
square that we were staying on, the uh, Piazza Rotonda, which is where the um, Pantheon is. So I did that and uh, I had all this footage because I do work from film, but I like to use my own stuff. I like to take it, I like to have been there, I like to have experienced that, so I don't like, you know, dragging stuff off the internet for not hilly, willy nilly. I have to feel a resonance, there has to be time elapsed, I have to come back and consider it, it's a lot. And you know, it's never, it's been said a lot, don't, you know, why take a bad photograph and make a bad painting? So I feel like I'm always aware like that's possible, that you're just doing bad paintings and bad photographs. So, uh, you know, I, I do it very guardedly, and by the way, being taught to work from life, I feel like a little conscience in there, so I, f I feel like I have to figure out what I want from it. I'm not, I'm trying not to copy. I, I'm always thinking that's the law. The law is not to copy. So here's a painting of the Borghese Gardens. It's quite big, five by five. It's down in North Carolina now. And uh, I include parks in this, and they're not all omniscient views. They're not all from above. And uh, this is the English Garden in Berlin, where the people swim naked in the middle of the city in this beautiful <laughs> I didn't make them naked, but they do get naked a lot in Berlin. And uh, Grand Central Station. What a place where people meet. They meet all in the stations, museums they meet. They meet in piazzas in Italy. They meet uh, crossing the street. This is um, owned by a friend of mine. In Venice. Oh, Venice. Who thought? Big painting. And this is the, um, coming up to the first show in New York 2012 I, in the cooperative gallery there. And I just thought, I'm going to do a drawing on canvas and just use a little bit of warm and cool and a little bit of pink, you know, with kind of cool pink, warm pink. Just try and see how that works. And just play around with these spaces between. You know, if it doesn't work, I just erase it with some paint, move it over, try and find the placement, try and get. My first order of business is to get that plane to work and to feel like uh, some figure lands, some place, some place I feel I can get it, and the scale, you know, declares itself. I really have to have it sort of say it, it, it's right. And one figure can hold and many can hold, but I have to get it right. And sometimes one guy is too big in some space and I'm, it's a scale issue, and I'll whittle away at a figure and suddenly it, it snaps into position. So I'm also thinking about the role, you know, like you look down, you're looking down on somebody more than if you look up. So the perspective isn't just stationary, it's dynamic, it's moving towards you and around. So the earth is going around, your eyeball is round. <laughs> yes, things are spreading and tapering as they come towards you. That, and this is just, again, you see the installation view, there's a guy there wanting to take a photograph. So it's another black and white, I, I call it like a wet drawing. And yeah, naked people, those Europeans, they like to drop their drawers a lot. If it's the right temperature and everybody else is doing it. But here's the thing, the only people who should be naked is that black and white couple up there. I feel like it's just a lot of adults who you know, really look better with their clothes on. But I like that cause the feeling of, you know, nature. <laughs> Who's, as it said, you know, nudity, middle class, you know, birth control. I feel like, <laughs> but I was saying, you know, again, I was feeling like I was addressing something very contemporary in this. And I, I guess um, in using some of my skills, I was having fun. Uh, Small. So I'm just going to pop through these because we're going to get up to these and I want um, some other examples that I'm not showing you. So I think this is in Green Hut. It's over there. Kite flyers. So I've had a good reception for this work. It's been nice. It's been nice to have this work appreciated and um, to, um, to be asked to speak and to show and so forth is certainly a very edifying and I'm happy about it. The middle painting, I don't have a side of here, but it's the um, um, Parisian Museum. The space is the Beauborg. They have these great elevators that go up these tubes. Uh, I think that's pretty much close to the end. Oh, this painting is pretty recent, 2016, and it's in the 
Uh, Foundation for the Carolinas. It's like f sort of the first big collection I've gotten into uh, with this work. So I'm really excited that the work is finding an audience that's more public and kind of more institutional. So quickly, I'll just go through these working process. You'll see that's the table down there, and this is one of these paintings. And I began it. I will start with this big overture of color, uh, a couple of color relationships, a few, you know, I take spray paint and I'll just start dabbing it with that and then I'll put something in overt like that the uh, shadow of the plane and then it sits there for a year I mean honest, honestly they just sit around and I, and I wait and then I get busy I get cracking so <laughs> this is not in order but I'm going to tell you this is that painting it went through a lot of changes this is an earlier version there's people in it uh, at the bottom, they're in the shadow. Uh, let's see what happens here. That's another version. I believe that is it. That's the finished one. So from that, from that stain up there to this grotto painting, that's what happened. So here's the thing about that painting. It's nine by six feet. So for me to get those those watery stains of reflection on the water surface. The brush is this big and I'm moving this material. So it's very exciting for me to get to that scale with a mark that is, that holds that plane. It's, I like that. And the thing about, these are acrylic and mixed media, but mostly acrylic, and uh, I use also um, flash and spray paint that's acrylic. But I have to say, the water media for me has been a real uh, way to push my other oil painting and everything else. And it's the speed, the wet, the liquidity of it, and the, uh, just the vernacular of it, of being able to invent while you're making a mark is, um, Pretty exciting. So um, again, the reason I uh, elected with Karina to go to Rome was I started doing these tree paintings from old material and I really enjoyed them. So I thought, I'm gonna go to Rome. And um, this is sort of a brother of that guy over there in the corner. If you remember those paintings of the figures uh, from way back in the early 80s, late 70s, I was doing these full-scale figures and I want to get back to that. I mean, I feel like these spaces peppered with these little colors are fine at a certain point, but I like form and I like, you know, building a body and have that figure do something. So everybody I know in this room knows what a clam digger is and some of this stuff I would walk by for 35 years and think, eh, clams, good. I'm glad someone's doing it. I love eating them. And then I got to be spending time in Deer Isle over a number of years uh, for a period of time in the summer. And I got to meet this fellow, Herbie, and I went out digging with him and just, it was astonishing how lively that mud is, that there's the life in there. You dig it, it changes color, becomes black. There's squirting animals in there. It's really great. I just, who knew? And it's a person doing something now with their body. Like, how often is that? I have a guy building an addition on my house now. I'm taking all sorts of pictures. I know he thinks I'm crazy or weird, but I'm like, you look so great hammering there. I'm just going to take a picture of you. <laughs> like, it just doesn't happen. Everybody's sitting at a screen now. <laughs> no one's doing anything. So I'm all about action, and that's what my work has been about a lot. And it's interesting that I'm going back to that. There's John, the, uh, my framer, John White. That's with his old boat. And, Cape Elizabeth. So I do portraits of people still. <laughs> this is a painting that's in my studio. I took it about three hours ago just to say, show you that I'm, I continue with this idiom and it's not done but it's sort of been fun to work on it. Here's that building my backyard that's 30 by 30. I thought when they put down that pink insulation it was like holy shit look at that pink. <laughs> I gotta get that. So I started painting the pink insulation and then these great guys were like pouring concrete. Well, pouring concrete to me is like pouring metal. It has that feeling, you know something's happening big. There's someone changing the, uh, just the, the, the nature, the look of something. It's gonna be permanent. And uh, that's how you feel when you look at molten um, bronze being poured into a mold. It's like, oh my God, the earth shook. I really felt like that they were playing with this kind of mythic material. 
So there's my studio. You can see the painting up there. See a painting up there in the upper right. I've had that pink there for probably three months. Now I could paint the painting in two days, but it's I sort of am just waiting. I don't, there's no rush. What am I worried? I'm, there's like no one standing in line saying, paint that painting, Grant. Come on. It's, life's gonna, huh? I just, I have a lot of things going. And there's the self-portrait recently. I did that as a demo for my last painting class I taught. Ah! And this is uh, the works on paper I've been doing the past few weeks, getting in preparation for going to, to Italy. It's not easy to bring materials in there. I'm going to be staying in this very uh, civilized flat. I don't want to have to pull out my oil paints and like spatter their silk rugs. I mean, I feel like Italians are very, you know, elegant people. So I'm just going to have like little gouache paintings. So this is a fellow, my daughter's uh, boyhood, childhood friend. Um, he's a painter. His name is Ryan Kish. He's a wonderful artist. Lives in New York. And uh, I did a little port. It's like this big. Tiny. His head's about this big. So I can work small, but it can still be very fresh and lively. Here's Karina. This is a recent painting, again, 12 by 12, not big. Just street life in the city. Kind of fun, I'm just enjoying myself. You know, weighing all those different blue grays to the blue. And I just thought, I you're painting this geisha in the middle of Fifth Avenue outside the Metropolitan New York. What? I like the guy on the left, like, Oh, he's watching. Am I painting him or am I painting her or am I just painting the whole thing? And then I thought she is on, she was the strangest character dressed as uh, in this, you know, national costume <laughs> with her fan <laughs> doing her dance with her little socks and everything. And I was like, she's like a little island. She put down her blue tarp and it was like she was sealed off from the whole world. It was like, I'm alone in New York. <laughs> I was like, she had that like zen, you know, she was just going to do her dance. So I'm doing a lot of that kind of work. Work from the street thinking, I'm going to be in Rome, it's going to be great to paint nuns. I'm just going, can't wait. And uh, my kid lives in New York and on Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, this is uh, Vanderbilt Ave, uh, you know, in Prospect, I guess, Heights, where that is. So that's that. I think that's the end, fino della Sarah. So if you have any questions, please feel free. I got to get out of here so you don't look at my ugly screen. <laughs> how do you know when a painting is finished? Who asked me that? I'm very curious. Oh, how do I know when a painting is finished? Um, well, I used to ask people that question a lot, painters, and I, I remember Mike Major said to me, I said, I'm not trying to be cute, I really want to know, and he said, he's a painter, who lived in Boston for a long, he had a, sort of a pretty big career, and um, he said, well, I don't think it's a stupid question, he said, do everything but one thing, do, don't do that last thing, because oftentimes I think the urge to perfect is too strong, and that it's uh, that there's, I'm all about freshness and keeping things understated and kind of undercooked because I think, what am I trying to communicate? I'm trying to communicate a movement, a shape and space that is, you know, alluding to a figure. I want, how much do I want to know? Uh, I want to know just by their gesture how old they are, what they look, what, you know, what race they are. I want to know all those things. I want to know what kind of class they are. I have a whole story in my head, in other words. So when I get that out of these figures, without overstating it, and they're all in the right place, and they haven't, things haven't shifted, because when I do one one place and I do another, like if I move it and put a color somewhere else, they all, it all changes, the whole thing opens up. It's, uh, it's very reminiscent of, the, um, I was a painter at the studio school, wonder, Graham Nixon, wonderful artist, he's very ill now, but I remember him speaking about painting, he said, you know, you do one thing, it's like, the house, you know, you close the attic window, the basement window flies open. You know, it feels like you're running around the house trying to, so there's a lot of balancing and trying to, so when all that is okay, when there's the, the dynamics of the picture are like settled down and it's acceptable and I've lived with it for a long time and I'm, I mean, someone will come in and they'll say, you know, you should do that one thing, I don't like that, you know, like the little girl red is wrong or something and I'm like, 
Yeah, fuck off. You know, I feel like I don't want to hear it. You know, no. You, I've, it's been painted three times. I don't need four times, five times. I don't need to hear your take on it. You know, like it's, people have different eyes and they have different expectations, and I just get what I need and then I'm out, over and out. But like that paint, you know, like these paintings here, these gouaches, they're hard. They're not, they, it's hard to make them look fresh. You know, I'm doing a lot there to make it look, I'm, I'm trying to um, simplify a lot of that foliage in a way that doesn't look overstudied. And I'm trying to balance the negative space with the positive space. I'm trying to tune, like, I mean, this painting, for example, I was like, well, should the lighter, should it be lighter on top of the water or lighter on the bottom? Because it can't be the same because it'll look flat. And yet, I do kind of want it to be flat. I want that background to sort of push a little bit, but I want it to push out of the painting. So there's a lot of that inner dynamic where you're trying to like just negotiate all these different power, powerful forces. Do the shapes lay down? You know, there's all that. And if you've painted, you kind of know that those are the things you're worried about. And plus, it can't be boring. There's so much boring work out there. Oh my God. I'm on Instagram all the time, and I feel like old friends, I just want to say, Stop putting your boring work up. Please go home and paint something fun to look at. My wife is writing a novel. I'm just going to offer this. And she has this little writing group. I'm going to make something public. So there's a very famous writer that lives in my town that just moved in. And he deigned to come and speak to the writing group of these very competent, uh, am although amateur in the sense that they're not published writers. Not amateur in their, the quality. So he read all their pieces and he said to them, these are terribly boring. Do you realize how boring this is? Talking about your children or your husband. You know, like this, there's just not, they're not interesting. And you realize something, someone says something like that to you, you have to take note of it and realize, you know, you're right. I don't need one more of those. We need, you need you to jack this thing up a little bit and liven it. And I feel, that so much of visual art is just resting on this kind of, just get it, yeah. Can, and there's many types of boring too. I mean, there's, there's boring that is not engaged or it's not dangerous or it doesn't feel like the person's taking any risks or it's too decorative or, all those things that are boring in a way in terms of, of artwork. Did I answer your question? Not at all. <laughs> when is something done? I don't know. Hi, Rachel. Hi. I'm so pleased to hear you talk about the trajectory of the bird over a long time. Oh, I know. Wasn't it boring? <laughs> <laughs> no, I tried to move fast. I have hundreds of work, hundreds of paintings to, sh to talk about. Uh, I just had a question about influences. It struck me, um, you know, two kinds of influences. One, other artists, and then the influences of I don't have not known, I don't know this work of hers. I have to look it up. I can imagine that she's a contemporary of Paul Cadmus, but a different case. Are you talking about someone other than... Um, Are you talking about Isabel Bishop? Or I think it sounds like Isabel Bishop, yeah. Yes, Isabel Bishop and Grace Harding are both in the same area. Yes, uh, thank you. What? It's Isabel Bishop, because I know those paintings that Isabel Bishop did of... Um, you know, Grace Harding is a second generation abstract expressionist. Right. Thank you. 
sorry, I should have initially said this about the ship. Um, walking through light, women walking through light, and the transition of movement over the body. And I see this in a lot of the uh, more recent words that you had. And I wondered about your personal influences and how the light influences coming through Well, I mean, these paintings of the figures moving through spaces are, I think, my mind was, uh, I'd just been traveling, and what you see are people standing in line, or waiting, and in the corners of your experience are refugees, people kind of on the edges, not really overtly, but I've been to Turkey, in the past five years we've been Northern Europe, Turkey, um, uh, Italy a few times, we travel a lot, this is in Croatia, so I'm thinking about avenues of uh, conveyance, and people moving through things. I mean, it seems to be natural after that experience in Rome and seeing how different the square was at two in the afternoon than it was at two in the morning. So um, you just see different people. The first thing you see in Rome are a lot of people in um, uh, selling things on the street on blankets. And you're immediately aware of that and you're also aware of the Gucci store where they're selling the bags for five grand. So there's like two things going on there and then you see the rich people wander by the, the blankets like looking down and buying and I'm just, you know I'm not terribly political but I'm aware of these inconsistencies and I feel that if I can address them in a way that's not too overt in my work and they're still fun to look at then I'm kind of doing part of the job which is to be aware and to it's a little bit like observing and painting and recording, it's just recording kind of what is there. So uh, in that sense, I'm, I'm not, I'm sort of aware of my environment in that way and thinking in those terms. So the Spanish steps is, is totally like an ice cream cone to sit on those steps and hang out. I mean, it's really kind of, you're not allowed there anymore, one. You can't go and sit there. It's, and um, I just feel like people pass through there. It's just your sense that there's this, this wall of humanity that just is constantly churning through a place, which you, you just don't see here. You don't see it even in New York City. It's very localized. People get off the subway, they get up, they go place, and they go back in the subway. There isn't that sense of kind of a swarm of people moving in and out. So um, that's what I'm thinking about, but I'm very aware of Isabel Bishop. I show her work when I'm in, because I think she did something very interesting with the grid and the, t and the kind of dot texture. She was trying to create this kind of filmy sense of moving through different spaces and not be literal. And uh, it's very frontal, it has a kind of quality, kind of an Egyptian quality, which is really beautiful. And she got that at the end of her life. She was really a WPA artist painting like girls on the subway, drawing, you know, doing. But then she got this kind of, she got this mythology in her and she really had something to say in her late 60s and 70s and did some really strong work, I thought. At any rate, influences. I was also just a note, uh, interested in Susanna and Poppy, I think is the last name you were looking for. That right. I worked with her at the Studio Center and I appreciate that, moving outside of that challenge, doing a hearty investigation and then moving outside of that challenge because it can become the thing and, and then it's well, not as much about painting per se or that's the danger of anyway. Well, and I've had, I know her and we've spoken a lot about this and she'll tell you about her early days painting like figure compositions a la Rubens and then having the skill and settling into this kind of quasi contemporary mode of doing a frontal portrait in many different guises, and, you know, stuff and that stuck a, struck a note and so who wouldn't be attend, but I think it would you know, the danger is not to do it enough. The danger is to do it too much. It's like success. The danger is success, but, you know, the danger is not success. I feel like it, there's a lot of potholes out there for artists to uh, avoid. And just the issue of keeping going and, you know, doing things is, 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 a, is a major thing. I'm too slow. I'm always amazed at people that can move a lot of material quickly and they don't feel like they can scrape off a lot of paint, they can put it on. I just, I find that very um, intriguing. So I'm always trying to up my game. 
I try and get big gestures going with paint because I think um, that's where some truth lies. I, I don't know. I think it lies in a small level too. I mean, I love paintings, um, you know, Dutch portrait paintings by Halls, but I, <laughs> I, I, I feel like uh, now it's, for me, I, I need to get things, <laughs> pump them up. It just, uh, so I'm always interested in seeing how people do it. I always think it's interesting to watch. People putting stuff on the floor and mopping it, I'm like, wow. <laughs> not my thing, I just, you know. I, I mean, I, none of that spilling stuff. Um, anyway, it's very, very, very nice to be here. Thank you very much, enjoyed it. <laughs>